And we are live, folks. Welcome to episode 3254 of the Survival Podcast, returning for his third appearance, hat trick on the Survival Podcast, Charles Mayfield. Charles, how you doing today, bro? Jack, I'm doing great, man. It was awesome seeing you in uh, in the flesh in Texas back in January. That was fun. It was a hell of a meal, too, though. I, I, I don't know if I've ever eaten that much beef in one sitting in my life. And I that's saying something for me. I've eaten a lot of beef. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the KNC cattle crew brought uh, brought the noise for that one. That was fantastic. That was and that was eat till you can't move, and they kept bringing more. Um, we're not here to talk about eating beef today, though. We're going to talk about eating pork. And I, I was really happy when I saw your proposed title of the show: "Swine, Salt, and Time: Hyper Niche Pork Production." So we're going to dig into that. But for people who maybe didn't catch you before, can you tell people just a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, happy to. So, uh, well, <laughs> the day job is is uh, commercial insurance mostly, uh, with a with a hyper focus on food, food manufacturing, food production, uh, restaurants, food manufacturers, things of that nature. But I've been a pasture based regenerative farmer since uh, er, late 2016. Got into uh, you know read everything Joel Salatin had written that I could get my hands on and and um, jumped uh, jumped with both feet into pasture-based uh, beef, pork, chicken production back in 16. Sort of turned that into a, uh, a, a small micro sort of buying club situation, uh, mostly clients in the Atlanta, Chattanooga, and then locally uh, here to – I live in Athens, Tennessee, which is my, my hometown. Um, and then – yeah, so about 2019, 2020, uh, began to explore uh, the uses of lard in skincare, uh, which sort of ultimately led to me launching uh, Faro, which is a lard-based skincare company in January of last year. And uh, yeah, so got a got a background in in insurance and risk mitigation, uh, regenerative farming. Uh, healthy lifestyle, nutrition. My my ex wife and I have co authored a number of cookbooks in the paleo space, and and uh, you know Pharaoh. Uh, we can get into it, but I, I really do want to talk about some epiphanies that hit, hit me New Year's this year. But uh, yeah, Pharaoh is really a, a, a convergence of all of those things. You know, healthy uh, pasture based farming, uh, metabolic health, regenerative ag. And uh, and my joys and uh, exploits in the kitchen as well. So that's how me in a land, nutshell. How much land do you have where you're doing your your pig farming? Man, it's um it's it's bumped around. Okay. Uh, I just, in fact, I've just moved into a new house. I've uh for your listeners, I've ac- I've actually shut my farming piece down for a minute. Uh, had to move. I was on leased land and had to move. Okay. And so the cows are still on pasture. I've got somebody managing those, but beef or pork and chicken is sort of put on the back burner for now. Um, But when when, when I was up and running, uh, the farm I was leasing was about, about 300 acres, uh, only, only about 120 of it in pasture. Uh, But, you know, I mean, Jack, you know, this, and this is, this is why I was really anxious to talk to you today. Uh, we, We would, I would only utilize a fraction of a fraction of that land at any one given day or week uh now obviously you got to have a little bit of land to move the animals and let you know let what you're leaving rest for for some period of time but um you know back in my early days of sort of getting started micro scale uh at the end of the day i think uh a handful of cows pigs and chickens at any one given time were on probably a combined half acre Okay. Um, you know, fractionated. They weren't yeah. all together, but yeah, uh, about a, about a half acre, and and that was obviously mobile. But um, you you know you can do a whole lot on on e- even an acre. Okay. Uh, but but yeah, we can get into that because that's where I was going with my first question is uh, choosing a a pig breed at the homestead level versus you know somebody that's farming eighty acres in rotational uh, grazing and what have you can do leader follower or whatever somebody that has a few acres is there a better breed or group of breeds i would say i would delineate the breeds into two categories um well maybe even three i would say depending on on your climate you know how cold does it really get 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then how much wooded area do you have? I would say that you could, you, the, the more woods you've got on your acreage, the, the, the more breeds you can play with. Um, okay. uh, and, and if it's all grass, let's just say you got a couple of acres of pasture, I, I would point you directly towards probably a Cooney Cooney. Uh, now they're, they're a smaller breed, but mm-hmm. they're more of a grazer. If, if for your listeners that don't or haven't seen a Cooney Cooney, they're more of a flat nose. They don't they don't really do a lot of digging and rooting. Mm-hmm. Um, every other breed I'm aware of, uh, we we work predominantly with old spots and red wattles. But uh, you know, there's a there's a ton of different breeds out there. Uh, those two I I can sort of certainly wholeheartedly recommend. And so yeah, if you've got more woods and and um, and areas that that you, you don't really care about the landscaping, uh, and and uh, certainly, you know, another point too is if you're just running pigs, you you could run almost any pig in, in a pasture setting. You may want to ring their nose. Uh, not something I do, but uh, I know there. I think Jim Garrish and a couple other folks that are out there doing doing big pig production. There's a Cooney Cooney. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, they're 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 great. Now they're going to finish at a smaller. Uh, smaller size uh you know i they're probably i don't know i've never run a cooney cooney but i think fully grown they're maybe 100 okay to 150 pounds whereas you know you get into some of the more um traditional breeds and uh market weight's gonna tip out around 300 350 or 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 sooner i mean you know you can finish a pig off and get plenty of fat on about 250 275 yeah i uh was totally opposed to the guinea hogs because they take so long to finish until I ate one. And then my opinion changed a great deal when I ate one. Well, so, you know, time can be your friend, right? This is, so that's a good segue. So in 2019, uh, I had a, an overabundance of pigs. I was breeding my own, doing some farrowing at the time. And we we had a couple of couple of litters um, that that were uh, uh, abnormally large, and so you know it got time to take take the piggies to the market, and uh, you know I, again I had a small customer base, and my my standard approach for the pig was for for consumer products was you grind the hams, uh, you you uh, you pull the Boston butts out of the shoulder, you use the chops and the bacon. And everything else goes into the grind. Okay. Um, and so here I'm sitting with all these pigs that, you know, I, I didn't want to feed any longer. I mean, you can keep feeding, but they just get bigger and bigger. You know, yeah. market 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 weight on a on a conventional pig, certainly in a in a semi-commercial setting like ours, is is between 300 and 350 pounds. And so, okay. you know, and and you've got dates scheduled at the butcher like if you cancel those when's the next date you're going to get and so next year yeah exactly and so this was early 2019 and uh i I ended up taking about six to the market that i that i really had to figure out what to do with and so what i ended up doing you know the chops the chops are easy to sell pig's not that different than than a cow you know you Mm. sell ribeyes and and strips all day. It's, yeah. it's the grind and various roasts that you got to get rid of. And so I'm, I'm very fortunate here locally to have, um, Ben, Alan Benton, Bentry, Benton country smoked hams, uh, in my backyard. And so I had scheduled these pigs at a processor that, that does do scalding and scraping, uh, for your listeners that don't understand, you know, you either skin a pig or you scald it and scrape the hair off of it to, to leave the skin on. And so they were able to scald and scrape these pigs. And so rather than ending up with, you know, close to a thousand pounds worth of sausage and ground pork, I opted to take almost all the hams and, and a number of the shoulders. And there, there there's one. I took a, a number of the hams and the shoulders and just requested them whole. And so skin on whole, um, you know, uh, front, front and rear quarters. And so, and, and I'd known Alan for a number of years, he has an open door policy where if you bring him a, a butt 
uh, or if you bring him a front or a rear, um, he'll cure it and smoke it for you. Sure. And so I, I rolled up with, I think it was six hams and four shoulders and was like here. And so they cured them, uh, smoked them. I got them back from Allen in about four months. Uh, you know, he done, he done his thing, which is he does a very traditional country salt cure yeah. and smokes them. And then, um, you know, fast forward, I, I've had to move the farm a couple times. This, this you know, the mobility factor in, in my farming practices is critical. These hams have hung in three different barns in, you know, three different climates. They, they've, they've traveled everywhere with me and, and I've been so busy. So long story short is um, coming up on New Year's of this year. I thought, you know, let's just try. I mean, this is a four, four year old hanging piece of meat hmm. and you know jack i to tell you the truth i thought when i when i bring this thing down and of course i clean it was covered with mold sure and blah 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 and you do the white vinegar brush clean it all off which is a messy process but man we cut into that thing you just showed the picture of it this is a four-year-old piece of meat and it, it was absolutely delectable um you know i i carved every little scrap off that thing ultimately that i could um I've still got the rest of them hanging in a barn, but when I saw you uh, in Texas, you know, we were talking about resilience and, 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 you know, we were talking about your biochar project before we hopped on. It's just, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes you just got to do things yourself yeah. to learn them. And the, the light bulb really clicked for me. It's like, you know, we're always talking about food sovereignty and we're talking about like making sure you have enough food to feed your family and, and preserving food and here this piece of meat's been hanging in a barn for four years yeah and so it 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 really sort of came together for me and you know i've got some references and guides and we can talk about sort of at the homesteading level um but but the idea that you've got this omnivorous animal you can i mean the good and the bad of a pig is you can feed them darn near anything sure um but and you can also have them, you know, on a micro scale. You know, one pig or two pigs. They like company, so I generally recommend two. No, I agree. Oh, they're fantastic, and um, you know, and, and they're smart animals. So you know, whether it's uh, poly netting from from like a premier one, or you setting up your own, you know, single or double strand fence, uh, they're they're very easy to to uh, contain. Uh, with a little bit of training because because of their intelligence level. And so, yeah, I really wanted to hop on and just sort of, forgive the pun, but chew the fat a little bit on yeah. on implementing, you know, pasture. Ba- I mean, p- a lot of people don't know that pigs were the first domesticated animal for food on the planet. Did you know that? I, 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 I'm not sure that I know that yet. I know that is the claim. I think it's a pretty right. valid claim, but I'm not sure it's true, but it, it makes sense. I think recorded well, recorded domestic animal, I think, is definitely the case. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I don't know why the pig uh, gets such a bad rap uh, from certain aspects of the world. Uh, you know, there's various religious contexts about the pig. And, and a lot of that makes sense to me. Again, they're a monogastric animal. They work very differently. Uh, you, you never see pork tartare, right? You know, you'll no. see beef tartare and ceviche and all these various uh, pseudo raw meats, none of that's coming from a gas monogastric animal. And so, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, if you undercooked your pork, you, there's a good chance you got sick. And so I, I would pull up a photo of what looks like when somebody has severe trichinosis, but somebody may be eating while they're listening to this. So I won't do it. Right. I mean, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. But 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 again, I, contextually, I understand this aversion to pork in a in an from an ancestral uh, perspective is because eating raw or undercooked pork could really screw you up and you know put you in the ground. And so here we are today. We we've got these amazing animals. They uh, a lot of the heritage breeds are just phenomenal. Um, back to your breed selection, you know, if you're a if you're a bacon fanatic, you might want to go with something like a large black, a little bit more of a torpedo-y type yeah. phenotype. Um, I do think the old spots, uh, 
again, personal preference represents sort of a balance between big butts and long bellies. And so I've been real pleased with that. But, you know, the point was, here's an animal that you can feed almost anything. Um, Very smart, very easy to contain. Uh, You know, the the, the biggest thing you got to worry about is feeding water. And if it's wintertime, watering them in the winter. But again, this whole pulling curing together, well, hell, you you, you get the piglets in uh, in the spring and you slaughter them in the fall. It's it's not that hard. And then there the meat sits for years, uh, if if need be, before you need to eat it. Yeah, and somebody here was mentioning like colonial ventures always included them. Um, early U.S. and colonial uh, North America, one of the most eaten things was salt pork Mm -hmm. and it's not the way we think of it like a chunk of bacon with a lot of fat on it it was like full-on salted till it was hard packed in a barrel pork if you watch uh jay Jay townsend and sons uh videos they have a lot that they do with that and you could buy like a like we say a barrel and you mean like a big giant 50 gallon coopered barrel they had those but they also had like small barrels that would have you know um you know, a tenth of a pig in it. But the big barrels might actually, by the time they were done processing it, have two pigs in one barrel. And it was literally everything. Like, you'd end up pulling the face out, you know, while you were unpacking your barrel. And, they, they you know, the old saying is you can eat every single part of the, the pig except the squeal. And there, there, there is something to that. Um, you mentioned processing, though, and that's been a bit of a challenge for some people. Um, to me, processing a pig... It's a lot like processing a deer if you skin it. I would prefer not to, but scalding and scraping is a pain in the ass. <laughs> so what, what should people do if they can't find a processor to do that for them? Well, so it, it, it's a little bit of a formula, right? So if you're used to deer processing, you might have to get a little bit heavier gauge uh, game pulley. You know, if yeah. you ever process a deer. I'm going to be fair. Like I'm generally processing feral hogs that are 100 to 200 pounds. Yeah. So, yeah. And so, so, okay. So you, you're limited, you know, you don't have a tractor to pick it up or you don't yeah. have this, you don't have that. Well, finish your pig at, at 200 pounds. Okay. You know, they, a, a, a traditional breed fed well uh, is, is going to have plenty of fat on it at 200 pounds. It, it's not going to have what a, you know, a market weight's going to have on it, you know, that extra half inch or inch of fat. But another workaround, you know, I hate everyone should scald and scrape at least one hog in their day just so they can appreciate yeah, <laughs> the process. That's what I'm <laughs> well, so 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 a fun workaround for that. And again, if you've got a if you're lifting the animal up and down to 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 um, scrape it or to uh, gut it, so from the from the ham forward. I would tell you, and again, I mentioned I've got some shoulders that have whole shoulders cured. Yeah. I, I would recommend from 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 the hams forward, just skin the silly thing. Okay. Right? And so if you're scalding and scraping, so imagine you've got this pig, you know, you've, you've, you've killed it, and you string it up immediately, and you lower its bottom torso into a 55-gallon drum, Okay. Right. That's filled with water. I forget the temperature. Um, I should have Googled this before we got on. There's there's an ideal temperature, water temperature for scalding. I think it's 130 degrees or 135, something like that. But you you lower the, uh, the the bottom half of the pig in and you agitate it for a couple minutes. You pull it out and you just scrape, scald and scrape the, the hams. Okay. Right. So now you can you can skin the rest of it. But you've got these skin on hams, which I, I think are the best piece of the pig to to cure salt cure whole. Agreed. Right. And then you can grind the rest of it. You can uh, I, I've got some books we can reference, but, you know, you can cut you can carve out the copa from the front shoulder. Uh, there, there's a couple of really good uh, uh, um, cuts out of the shoulder and and. Um, and uh and you know cut the rest up into uh pork chops you know that we, we we live in a day and age where we've got refrigeration and frozen the ability to vacuum seal and freeze things and you know i, I don't know how how you feel about this but i've pulled vacuum sealed frozen meat out of a freezer that's 12 to 18 months old and it cooks up and tastes just you fine you would never know you never know, know. 
When people say fresh, maybe you'd tell. But if you ate a piece of meat that was frozen for a week or frozen for a year and they were done properly, you'd never pick which one was which. I, I, I don't. I don't buy into that at all. I completely agree with you there. What your approach sounds like, though, is like my approach when I when I do ducks, I process ducks. I'm not plucking a whole freaking duck, but duck skin is delicious. So what we started doing, we don't even scald them for this. We just once they're dispatched, we just pluck the breast, yep. right? And then we debreast, and then we pop out the leg quarters, and then the rest the dogs can have at it until it ends up in the compost pile. And you end up with a few little fuzzies on it. You just take a butane torch and torch them off and you're done. But I did learn, do the butane torch before you take the cutlet off the bird because mm -hmm. the skin wants to shrink up. So if it's <coughs> attached, it pulls the other skin with it. And then when you cut it off, you have a nice skin on breast. So it's kind of like, that's easier than what you're talking about, but it's a good shortcut. I guess the only thing in that is like, there is one other piece of pork that I want with the skin on it. Because I'm not going to make bacon out of it. I'm going to roast it, and I want the skin on the freaking belly. Because roasted pork belly, where you cut the hashes in it and the skin, oh, my God, that's – that's oh. <laughs> Well, the good, the, the good news for your listener is uh, the real difficulty in, in scraping a pig isn't the belly. Because it's this long, flat surface. So if yeah. you want to you scrape your bellies, by all means, scrape them. It's – it's working around like the hip joints yeah. and the knee joints. And God, for, listen, I love, I absolutely love porchetta de testa. Yeah. Um, for your listeners that don't know, that is salted cured uh, pork head. And you literally debone the entire head, yeah. skin, ears, nose, and all, tongue as well. Roll mm -hmm. that up salted and, and let it cure. It's amazing. But, but scraping a, a pig's head is a chore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how much land you're kind of on this already? But how much land do you think people really need to to do this and to do it at a meaning a meaningful enough level to put a good amount of meat in their own larder every year? Sure. So <clears throat> I would say you know again, not dependent on family size or anything like that. Let's just talk about a two pig setup. Two two pigs together versus one. You know, they're gregarious, happy animals. They like, yeah. a, like a buddy. And so a two-pig setup, if you've got a wooded area that you don't mind gets uh, thrashed up a little bit, I'd say yeah. you can totally finish uh, and, and not overburden the land. You can finish two pigs on an acre, no problem. Okay. Uh, you know, you're going to break that acre up into, <laughs> let's call it, let's break it up into, you know, 10 tenth of an acre paddocks or, uh, or five, you know, mm -hmm. fifth of an acre paddocks. Um, five, five's pushing it a little bit. You'd, you'd want you'd want probably six to eight weeks of rest if if the land is the only thing you care about. But here we're sort of trying to balance land with food production. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'd say you could get away with with an acre, especially given the fact that it's going to be dormant theoretically for about six months out of the year. So. Um, so let's start at the beginning. <clears throat> You're going to buy in feeders, right? They're going to be weaned at six to eight weeks. Okay. Okay. And if you're going to take a traditional breed up to market weight, which I'm going to define as 300 plus pounds, that's okay. going to be about another six months. Okay. okay. So get them in the spring, you know, and, and you know, even push uh deeper into the spring because when you're killing them in the in the fall ideally maybe it's cool yeah or even really cold that way you know you can you can kill them and uh sc scrape what you want get them gutted and then let them hang um now the beauty of a pig uh you know this but for your listener the beauty of a pig is there's there's no aging required right this is a monogastric animal you know with beef and lamb and and go, you know, I, I, I like to see a minimum, but ideally 14 days of, of aging to uh, really loosen things up and get the flavor uh, in the meat. Pork, you can literally eat it the next day. Uh, totally good. But again, back to the model, two pigs. Uh, you're going to, uh, I, I look back at my earlier um, spreadsheets from when I was just getting started, because those, those to me are the true beginner spreadsheets. And we were running about 800 pounds of total feed 
through a pig from from wean to, to market weight. Um, so 800 total pounds of feed per pig. You know, that's not a lot with just two pigs, so you can probably deal with that just going to the local feed store. Uh, I would recommend wholeheartedly at least going non-GMO. Uh, I don't think you have to go organic. Uh, you know, again, if pigs have access to pasture and grubs and, uh, and, and rooting around, you know, they're, they're going to pull their multivitamin out of the ground. You don't have to worry about necessarily giving it to them through feed. So um, I, would, I wouldn't go below the non-GMO feed option. And there's some, there's some decent Tucker milling is a, is a, is a pelletized non-GMO feed uh, manufacturer. They're, they're prevalent here in the Southeast. I'm sure they're all over m- most of the country at this point, or cer- certainly regionally, I see them up into um, Ohio and Indiana, those areas. Um, you don't get as much enzyme out of, you know, a lot of the heat generated by pelletizing a, a feed uh, destroys a lot of the enzymes, but on a, on a very basic nutrient level, you're going to get everything you need. And then again, as long as they got access to land uh, and pasture or, uh, or just, just dirt to dig through, then they'll get, they'll, they'll supplement themselves pretty well. And so, yeah, you raise them up to, again, they will be market weight. You, I, again, I know old spots very well. You give an old mm-hmm. spot, you know, four to five pounds of feed a day for six months, they will be 300 pounds. So if you're, if you're a little worried about that size that animal, then, you know, maybe you're feeding them out for, you know, four and a half, five months instead yeah. of six. Yep. And then, yeah, just, String them up and and uh, harvest them in the fall. What is your go to method for the average person for putting them down? Shot to the um, head. Uh, yeah, I like. Well, first of all, you'll be six months in. You'll have a very. This is the hardest thing I have ever done. Yeah. So to be clear, it's the hardest thing you do. But um, yeah, I, a nine millimeter back of the head, right behind the ear. That's okay. uh, that's generally the method that I've used. Um, I, I really like, uh, I have a Tyrant 45, uh, noise suppressor for my, um, for my, uh, Glock and it works great. I see somebody putting a captive bolt is the best way. Captive bolts are great if you're in a slaughterhouse, but sure. if you're in your backyard, uh, nine millimeter, I, and I wouldn't go much smaller than a nine millimeter. Uh, you could probably get away with I know people get away with 38s and three eighties and various things. I just, you don't want to have we, to shoot them twice. When we raised the uh, guineas up in West Virginia, we used a youth youth load loaded down thirty thirty. Yep, that do great it. front shot straight between the eyes, and they went straight down. I mean, like, and they're it's not real loud with that downloaded thing in the long barrel of the rifle, you know. Yep, yep. I re- I really like behind the ear. Um, okay, I, I've seen situations com- coming at them from the front. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, in fact, I can tell you, I know of a situation coming out in, in the last second, the pig dropped its head and that bullet oh. went through the top of the nose. Yeah. And, uh, you, you do not want to be around a pig no. uh, that weighs 300 pounds or even 200 pounds that's been shot through the top of the nose. So yeah, a little, uh, a little feed on the ground, something sweet for them, uh, be right behind them and, and, uh, it's lights out. I've talked to several people. They give them like the last meal, like pig nirvana, a can of beer and a bowl of grain. And, you know, then they're in that and that is exposed perfectly then for that shot. Well, you know, Jack, if you're doing it right, then you've probably got a, a mash that you just finished distilling for your uh, fuel, oh, yeah. fuel, for my fuel, fuel for yeah, the yeah, winter. Yeah. And so uh, a, a pig n- loves nothing more than s- spent uh, corn mash. Uh, fresh ah. out of a uh, out of a fuel manufacturing coffin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would so. be it too. Um, you mentioned some books. Do you have any recommended literature? I have two th- that that are big for me. Ryan Farr's Whole Beef Butchery uh, okay. or Whole Beast Butchery. Beast. Whole Beast Butchery is a phenomenal book in ter- in terms of the disarticulation of the animal. And actually, they he covers um beef pork fowl he he covers a ton of stuff in that book in terms of the butchering side um this uh name again i'll make sure it's in the show notes for people yeah 
Ryan Farr, and it's F A R R. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's a phenomenal book. Great. It's a, it's a very picture heavy book, you know, in terms of like where to cut and what to do. I, I I've had that book for a number of years. It's a it's my uh, butchering bible, and um, and so that's a big one. And then um, the curing and smoking made at home book by Dick and James. I think it's Strawbridge. Yeah, Strawbridge. This is here's a picture of that book. This thing is the Bible, man. And uh, you know, we, we we alluded to. I mean, this call was really this real. It was really. Uh, put together with with the ham but man you start getting into salamis and all the various things that you can do with a pig and and, and you know a, a basic metallic you know pewter or uh whatever hand grinder i mean you, you can do all of this stuff by hand no no power required uh you know it just it just takes time but but you know when it comes to curing and uh and food preservation time is your friend and um talk about a great way to get the kids involved or or even the neighbors um yeah so those are the two those are the two big ones i've got uh, the meat bibles another book uh the lobel's meat bible that's a great one but that's more on the culinary side um you know the the cure I, I i will tell you the curing and smoking made at home is a is a game changer book uh in terms of and and they cover a whole bunch of different stuff beyond beyond pork Let's turn the corner of that into the curing stuff because not everybody listening is going to have the ability or desire to raise pigs. But the one wonderful thing about the world we're living in today is that there's so many people doing it. I promise you, if you reach out just a little bit within 50 miles of you, there's somebody doing it you can buy from. And so people have access to this high quality pork. So what is what is kind of some of the best curing methods to use with this high quality pork? Oh man, my, my, most of my curing experience has been bacon and hams to this point. I've never, candidly, I've never done my own salamis. Uh, I've yeah. helped some people do them, but I mean, the, you've got, you've got a couple of, you've got curing salt, number one and curing salt, number two. Now these are the, I, I don't really want to get into the bait about, you know, um, about the various curing salts that are out there. Um, yeah. but I mean, at the end of the day, most of your curing can be done with just salt and uh, sea salt. I would not use I would not use table salt for anything. Yeah. Uh, e- either a good sea salt, you know, I recommend like the Baja Gold or the Sea Agri uh, salt. I, here's here's a funny here, here's a here's a um, what do they call these things? A cheat code for your listeners. If you're running. Uh, if you're running uh, any type of ruminant species, and hell, I, I'd even give it to your pork as well. Uh, C Agri, S E A A G R I, uh, their C90 uh, livestock mineral supplement mm-hmm. is sea salt. Okay. It's just sea salt, right? So the 50 pound bag that you're dumping in some of the water or putting into, like, you know, with, with a lot of ruminant species, you put like a mineral lick. Yeah, uh, trough out. It's the same damn salt, and so yeah. if you're getting salt to feed your your livestock, um, get a couple extra fifty pound bags. It's it's not like it's going bad. Uh, yeah. I have used that salt for curing a ham before. I have used that salt for curing bacon. Again, I'm not as proficient in the ground uh, infused um, curing uh, uh, the salamis and the various things. Uh, I have done a I've done a, a copa, and I've done a porchetta de testa. But again, this is rolling things up. You know, it's it's not grind. Yeah. It's um. So yeah, Redmond yeah, exactly. salt. I see somebody mentioned. Yeah, Redmond. I, I, any I, that's my go to. That that's... well, I I will tell you the sea agri stuff um is is pretty amazing because of so the Redmond stuff is is mined. So it's yep. a salt, it's a salt deposit, right? Yep. And it's it's fantastic stuff. The sea agri stuff, I will say, I, I didn't, I don't want to really over commercialize this, but yeah. it's 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 actually mined from uh, from the ocean. So you know the tides come in and out, 
And so uh, the reason they call it C90 is they've, they've measured. It's got all 90 trace minerals I got you. Uh, that exist in salt above the sodium and chloride that, that make up salt. And so uh, I use it especially for my livestock because I don't know what my livestock need, but they do. They know. Yeah, yeah they, they know. And whatever they don't use comes out the back end and ends up in my grass. So, yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah. Now, on when you were saying about you can use some of these mineral supplements for curing your meat. I have not found it in my local feed store, but I was told that a lot of feed stores will carry Redmond's number one, they call it, a big 50-pound sack, and it's the same damn thing that you're buying in a 10-pound bucket on Amazon. So that might I, be available, too. I, I, I'm hesitant to say salt is salt, yeah, right? But, but salt I, is salt. <laughs> well, it, you know, I would How say was it processed? How was it handled after it was extracted? Yeah. Salt, yeah. salt is salt. Uh, I would certainly even say sea salt is sea salt. Now, again, not all salts are created equal. Again, the C ninety's got, I think, more minerals in it than than your run of the mill salt. Um, it's you know, it, it's more expensive. It's it's also harder to to mine because it's it depends on the tides and all that. But the Redmond stuff I've used plenty of times. Uh, I would say for your listener, the Redmond in a fifty pound sack versus the Redmond in a ounce and a half shaker bottle from the store um get the 50 pound sack yeah yeah and when you're saying it's not going to go bad it made me think of this and we have we have new jersey to thank for what i'm about to show you because they said any food item has to have an expiration date on it so i bought this bottle of himalayan salt it's supposed to be 250 million years old expires in september Pretty lucky they dug it up in time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not going to go bad. Absolutely. Um, how long does it take to raise a pig and cure the meat to where you have a finished product? Well, assume you get a feeder at eight weeks old. You've got uh, six months to raise it to 300 pound market weight. Uh, a day to kill it. I would say salt and cure, depending on what we're talking about. If it's a ham, you're going to, you're looking maybe six months down the road. If we're talking salamis uh, and some of the other um, more artisanal stuff there, uh, it can be a matter of weeks later. It's ready to, to ready to eat. Right. But, but again, it will store for significantly longer. So yeah, I mean, start to finish from the, from, from the pig taking its first steps on your property. I'd say you've got cured amazing stuff to eat seven months later. Gotcha. So now I know you said you don't want to get into a big debate on the whole nitrites and the salts, but what is the deal with nitrites and nitrates and curing salts? What, what is that all about in your opinion? Um, well, I think it's about dietitians and people that want to sound important. <laughs> um, having an ax to grind. Um, I I've had a couple people, you know, I've got this skincare company based out of lard and I've had, I've had people come at me with, uh, well, lard's higher in polyunsaturated fatty acids, this whole PUFA argument. Yeah. And, and, and that is true that, mm -hmm. you know, if you feed a pig, this is, you know, there's two sides to the pig coin. Yes. I can feed them anything, but also you can feed, they'll eat anything. And so pigs are very good at, metabolizing their diet and storing it in their fat. Um, so you, you want to make sure you're feeding a pig. Well, uh, the point being, you can feed a pig a very low PUFA diet and their fat is low in polyunsaturated fatty acids. Fantastic. So, you know, the nitrate nitrite ax to grind, um, you know, I, look at the alternatives. So you get into some of these celery salts and the various other, here's the beauty of nitrates and nitrites. It is a specific formula. You put this much curing salt number two in for this many ounces of ground meat to make your salami, right? Mm -hmm. It is because the science behind that curing salt number two is this is how much you need to, to do the job. When you get into some of these more natural remedies, the celery, celery salt is a, is a common one. 
there, there's no formula for the uptake of the salt into the meat. And so you almost have to overburden it. Uh, and then you're also guessing because because you don't know, you don't really know how much it's really going to take to get the job done. And so, I, you know, I don't want to die uh, eating the food that I make. And so, you know, everything comes with a price uh, in terms of what this nitrates and nitrites argument is about. And is it ultimately the best thing for human health? I don't know, man. Hmm. Uh, I, 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 I like, I like applying science and technology where it serves me. And the fact that I can measure out a specific amount of, you know, a curing salt number one or curing salt number two, knowing it will get the job done. And I, there's no more guesswork um, is, is great. Yeah. I see, I, I, I see our renegade butcher comment about yeah. nitrates are harmful, but botulism is also harmful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, there it, it is different. I think when you start playing around with ground meat, you know, you oh, mentioned, absolutely right. You start mentioning things like steak tartare. We don't make steak tartare out of hamburger. <laughs> when, we, when we expose all that surface area, we really need to be careful with what we're doing. Um, I can't. The farmstead meat smith, I think, is the guy's name, Brandon something. Yeah, I had him on years ago, and he was saying most of what he does, he does just plain salt. Mm -hmm. But we really didn't get into making salami with him. I mean, that to me, having that safe, secure knowledge that if I'd put this much weight of meat to this much curing salt, I don't know, man. I've been eating this stuff since I was, you know, knee high to a grasshopper, and and I ain't dead yet. So uh, I have a feeling if I ate it improperly done, it might just kill me. Right. I mean, that's well, you know, well, Jack, one of the beauties of salt is that shit will get everywhere. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, so, so take that ham of mine, right? We yeah. just, the skin's on it. We just salted the outside of that thing. Right. Yeah. So it, it got in where it needed to get in. I, I agree with you. The, the, the whole thing with, with ground meat is you, you've got all these miniature surface areas and, and, and you really do have to be careful Again, the, the beauty, again, the beauty of salt is it will go everywhere. The, the, the level above that, <clears throat> excuse me, with these curing salts is it's a specificity situation. Like I, this is all I need and it will do the job. And, you know, I can't, I don't have a formula for using sea salt or, you know, table salt when you're, when you're mixing up your salami batch. Mm -hmm. So so, you know, we've talked about putting these critters on pasture or in the woods or what have you, um, but we do have to feed them. So what what should we look at as a feed requirement for 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 pigs? So it, it, it works on a scale. So in terms of weight, a, a, a young pig, again, you got this weaned pig, eight weeks old. They're going to eat between two and a half to three pounds of feed a day. Okay. And at the very end of the, of the spectrum of finishing out, you know, four or five, six months later on average that, and again, this is just my own experience, but yeah. you're, you're talking about about five pounds a day. And so that number I gave you earlier, that 800 pounds of feed, that was sort of the six month total yeah. per pig. Um, now, you know, again, in a homesteading situation where you have scraps and waste and you know, maybe you've got a lot of, of um, oaks and various, um, you know, tree nut mm -hmm. <laughs> producing uh, type, type situation, then, then I, I like to plan to feed them out. And then if they just get extra feed from the environment, then that's, it's just more fat. Sure. Right. Um, you know, <laughs> pigs are going to eat. But, um, but yeah, and, 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 you know, for your listeners, I would recommend even at a small scale, Osborne, uh, Osborne makes a, a beautiful small scale. I think it holds maybe 150, 200 pounds of feed. Uh, it's one of these, uh, rotational, uh, pig feeders. I think it's an R2 or R1 is the, this is the one I was using for, for years. Now, you know, you get 15, 20 pigs. You, you got to scale up, but if sure. th this thing is basically indestructible, uh, there's zero feed waste, right? If you're throwing this stuff out on the ground, 
um, it, uh, it, it can, you know, th- th- there's inevitably some food waste there. Um, but yeah, it worked really well. I ended up uh, bolting it to the top of like an aluminum um, pallet. Okay. And it was still still very light, but you could hook it to a four wheeler, pull it through the woods. Yeah. You could even drag it. Now, if it was full, you wouldn't want to drag it, but sure. you, know, you, you let them empty you it out. It when they empty it, right? That's exactly <laughs> right. And so, you know, and so back to sort of the model, right? So let's just say you've got an acre and you're doing, you know, one fifth acre paddocks. So you put the feeder in there, you measure out, okay, you know, one week's worth of feed is 60 pounds of feed. You put 60 pounds of feed in there, and if they finish it early, <laughs> then maybe they go hungry for a day, which yeah. is not a bad thing for an animal, uh, especially when you're trying to motivate them to move to the next paddock, right? Yeah. And, you know, just like humans, it's not bad to intermittently fast every now and then. And, and it, you know, they'll, they'll dig a, a root a little bit more aggressively work if they're hungry. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, root, and I think root. people – People doing it to couple pigs. I mean, reach out to friends and stuff because, like, when we had that farm up in West Virginia, one of our partners in it, Kelvin, he had a you know regular old residential, nice house, pretty big yard, and it was full of oaks, white oaks, and he brought five like contractor size hefty sacks full of white oak acorns to the farm. And I'm like, where'd you get it? So I raked them up on my property. I said, how long it take? He said about five minutes a bag because we're such a heavy mass that year. And he just raked them up and took a flat shovel and threw, you know, not trying to clean them or anything. And so you're talking like five, like 30 gallon contractor bags of acorns. And that's plenty for a couple to oh. finish on, right? I mean, they oh, got for sure. acorn finished pig. And they ate that like it was candy. I mean, I've got I've got a friend when I when when I was pastoring pork, they live in a neighborhood over here. That's just, you know, it's just a standard sort of neighborhood cul-de-sac kind of deal. And she would bring me five gallon but because they would just fall out, end yeah. up in the yard. It would rain. And here they are. She would just go down to the curb. Yeah. And oh, so, yeah. Because they roll because <laughs> they roll. And yeah. um me buckets of acorns and I mean, you know again dropping and you're hunting in the woods it sounds like it's raining when the mass starts to drop i mean you could just throw a couple tarps around a couple trees for a couple days and then just and i mean it, it's not something we generally think about joe's asking here um pecans and walnuts i i don't know that the how that works yes they please know? oh <laughs> So, so one of my one of my insurance customers is is the Georgia Grinders. Uh, for your listeners, uh, they make amazing nut butters. They're out of Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, and I, I I handle their commercial insurance, and so every now and then, they would have a super sack of organic peanuts, and you know the the forklift fork punches a hole in the bag, right? Well, they have to yeah. condemn the whole thing. I'd get a call, you know, every month or so. And it, you know, uh, whether it was pecans or almonds or peanuts, again, if it's a nut, e- no, even a legume it. like 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 a peanut, peanuts not a nut, folks. It's yeah. a it's a legume. But oh my god, talk about that Last Supper every yeah. day, man, every day. And <laughs> and again, if you've got a, if you've got a local brewery, if you've got a local distillery. You know, they if they haven't already inked a deal with somebody, they're always looking to get rid of spent grains out of their yep. brewing uh, or distilling outfit. And my God, it's all you've gotten rid of is the sugars that were converted to alcohol. All the other nutrients are still in there. Yes. Uh, Zone six, Eric says my hogs eat black walnut, which surprises me because they are hard. Seems impossible, but they break them. Um, having broke a few of them in my time, they are hard, but it makes me think of Cletus from the Simpsons. He says, anybody tells you a hog won't take off a finger. They's lying. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I, they, they have some of the strongest mouths out there, sharp teeth. And I have watched, uh, Jack, I've watched a pig pick up an acorn and, and toss it in its teeth and shell the acorn. I have watched oh, really? them pick up an acorn and spit the shell out and eat the nut. They, it's 
it's unbelievable. Yeah, any any nut they will they'll eat anything. Yeah, they'll eat anything. I would tell your you know your listeners if you're hopefully you're not buying you know shit food from the grocery store. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't feed them that. I wouldn't feed them anything that's got preservatives or any of that no. junk in it. They'll eat it. Yeah. Rest assured, they'll eat it. But milk will put fat on them too when people have oh, surplus yeah. milk. Uh, and then I, I, I've never done this, but I can't believe they wouldn't tear into it. One of the easiest mass trees to grow is American persimmon. And what's oh, beauty, yeah. beautiful about that, it won't drop until it's ready. Like if you pick them, you got to bled them. But when they fall, they're pure sugar. And we shouldn't be eating tons of sugar, but if you want to put fat on something, give it give it sugar, man. I mean, persimmon and acorn finished pork sounds like a niche in of itself, oh, you know. It would be so so again, okay, back to you know your 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 listener situation. If you got a lot of, you know, uh oak trees or you've got some persimmon trees, you know, pay attention. When does everything hit the ground? Back yeah. up from there five months. Yeah. Or four months. Yeah. Right. Back up four months. And now you're going to finish those. And again, pigs are smart. They'll go anywhere. So if the persimmons are on this side of the property and the oaks are on this side of the property, just move them around. Yeah. Yeah. And your persimmons will drop later in the year generally. So you yep. move them from oak to persimmon to bowl full of beer grain and, and a bullet in the head. You know, that's right. People say they have one bad day. I'm like, if you do it right, they have one bad second. Oh, for sure. You know, and they don't even know it if you do it right. You know, they I mean, don't know it. And, and 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 I will I will tell you, Jack, it'll change your life when you raise an animal, take its life, and consume it. It'll, it it'll change. It'll change your life. Thing. It is a different thing, even when it's just a bird. You know, I mean, it it's still it's like you're, you know, I grew up hunting too, so I didn't when I really started raising my own meat on property, I didn't know how I would actually feel about doing it because as a hunter, I've always felt, well, I earned that right to take that life because that animal had a chance. I didn't go to a zoo, pay a guy money, and then go pop a gazelle and take a picture with it. Went out in the woods with a deer that actually has every advantage, especially if you're in a tree with a bow. Right. And so I had to, you know, so there's deer that I had four weeks of hunting to get one deer. And luckily I wasn't trying to live on it. Um, but even a dove, you know, if you can knock down an animal the size of your fist moving 60 miles an hour in a tailwind, kind of earn that. But when that animal trusts you, like it's a different experience. But it's also like if you're going to eat meat, then taking that responsibility on yourself, I think, is really important. And then I think what happens is it doesn't matter if you did it. From that point forward, every piece of meat you consume, you have a reverence for the animal that that was sacrificed so that you could eat well. I will I will tell you that that my pigs live a far better life than wild ones, right? So if you yeah. want to have that conversation, sure. we can. Um, and, and even you know, domesticated cows live a far better life than deer, elk, <laughs> any of the wild ruminant species that are out there um you know predation they don't they don't have to worry about predation especially with pigs so there, there's yeah. another there's another bonus feature wild you know. pigs do three things they eat they fight and they breed yeah. and they literally don't do anything else and i've been on a stand before and had some pigs around it and none of them were i thought maybe a bigger one would come in so i'm kind of waiting to take my shot there's a young boar probably a hundred ish pounds and there's some little piglets following a fairly small sow because they'll you know they'll breed early as heck and that one of those piglets got too close to that boar and he grabbed it by the back leg and tossed it like a rag doll now it ended up being okay but i mean it screamed right and that's kind of like that's a day in the life that's that that's actually a pretty good day nothing that bad happened uh i shot that same trip i ended up shooting one that was about 220 pounds and it probably would have been heavier, but it's it's left leg. It was almost like nothing was there. And uh, the guy on the land I was hunting on said he, that he probably got gored by another pig. Mm -hmm. And it basically just rotted that leg. And it was all healed up. There was just no muscle left in it. And so, yeah, you. it's a hard life. I mean, it is. 
And 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 for those out there, I I will challenge anybody. You you come and you come into close contact with a two hundred pound wild boar, and and call me about how innocent and uh, and caring <laughs> Mother Nature is. You, you you give me a shout anytime. Um, but uh, again, but the nice thing about pigs, especially once if you're if you're buying weaned feeders, you know they're already twenty five thirty pounds. Uh, when I was farrowing. You, you would you would literally have to worry about aerial predation when they were that, that first three to four weeks because they're okay. just little bacon bits and, a, and yeah. a hawk will a hawk or an owl will grab one of those Take things up and away. they're gone but once their feeder weight size you, you don't you don't really have to worry too much too much about predation certainly once they get up above 100 150 pounds and yeah. they're surrounded by electric netting yeah uh, we haven't talked about that but please uh for your listeners do not try and build a permanent non-electrified fence for pigs period no. end of story you don't need it it's 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 actually overkill and it's not effective um you, pigs uh, break uh, shit we should just probably tell people that pigs break shit that's it's what they do it's so true you could put it on a t-shirt that just said pigs break shit <laughs> they and taste do. good yeah, and taste they good. They break shit and they taste good. good. They break waters. They break feeders. They break fences. They yep. break your damn bone if you ain't careful. Uh, Patrick says, what are your thoughts on the IPP breed? I said Idaho pastured pig. I don't know. So I'm, I'm deferring to yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's um, you know, let's see. I, I was looking at that. I'm not as familiar with it. it comprises Duroc, Cooney, Cooney, and Berkshire pig breed. So it's, a, I guess it's a crossbreed. Okay. Um, you know, my comment is uh, I, there ain't a pig I don't like. So yeah. if it works for you, if uh, I, I, I'm not a big fan of Durocs. I've heard they're a little bit more aggressive. Um, and, and again, aggression in a pig can be a good thing, but you know, I've had small kids and, various things you know and, and maybe that's an old wives tale i've never experimented specifically with durox but uh my experience with the old spots and the red wattles was very positive i don't have i don't have any issue with any pig breed out there i can't wait to run some mangalitsas at some point um I, and i'm i'm open to experimenting with any of them so for for your listener i don't have a problem with them i, I don't have I, a problem with any pig either I, I have no idea what breed of pig i'm eating when i pop ferals so and they all taste damn. Anybody tells you that wild pig isn't good is wrong. I'm just going to say it. They're wrong. Or maybe they well, ate some that was handled by some idiot, you know, that, that shot it in June and let it lay in the back of a pickup for four hours in the sun or something. I, I don't know. But I've never shot a wild pig, processed it myself, and then said, gee, this doesn't taste good ever. And my wife is one of the more picky eaters there is. She'll try anything, but if there's anything off about it, it's like, and I mean, she'll eat wild pork. You know, I mean, I don't, I don't know where that comes from. Now, if it's a boar and it's, you know, a mature boar, they do stink, but you don't put that into the meat. It's all about how you handle the processing. Yep. Well, so I'm glad you brought that up. So boar, boar taint is what it's called, yeah. does exist. I have experimented personally, and I've talked to some people that have done this. A lot of that is driven by, uh, boar taint is driven by a poor diet uh, coupled with starvation, okay. right? And so if you're, if, you're, if you're killing a wild hog, let's just say in an industrialized farming area. So okay, that, would, a lot yeah, of, that would make a difference. Right? Um, that's a little different. I, so I raised some domestic, we, I decided not to cut, uh, which is castrate for your listener. Yeah. I decided not to cut a number of the boars that I had in one of my last batches and we raised them up and I processed them. And even my, uh, breeding boar Brutus, when he ultimately went in for his one last day, weighing a cool 850 pounds, that was a, by the way, that was, that was a lot of ground pork in the fridge. Um, Tasted amazing. Yeah. So so everything I've read about boar taint, a, a it absolutely exists, but but B, if you're it so if you're raising your own pigs, I don't know that you necessarily have to stay away from an uncut boar. Yeah. Um, but if you're working with a farrower, somebody that's raising pigs up and weaning them, 
uh, chances are they're cutting everything once they're you know basically right after they hit the ground. So you're yeah. you're not gonna you're not gonna have to deal with too many uh, Smoky Mountain oysters. Yeah. Uh, Bill says, I planted 12 apple trees three years ago, and now I'm a ketivore. How much apple can be fe- fed to finish? I I like all of it. Yes. <laughs> yes. They'll eat them all, I promise yes. you. Um, I know Stephen Sobekayak up in uh, Canada, r- the Miracle Orchard guy, um, he finishes his broiler chickens on apple. And they just take oh. anything that the customer's not going to want and just th- they do electro net right between the rows of trees and they throw them in there. And he has freaking broiler chickens that people buy for Thanksgiving because oh, yeah. they're so damn big. It's like a small turkey, you know, the 12 pound dressed bird is a small turkey, but he's doing uh, that with chickens on apples. Uh, omnivores are awesome. And so, OK, let's just, so let's let's take Bill's example. So if he's got an orchard, let's just say he's got a two or three acre orchard, pretty big orchard. Okay. Um, what I would do again, poly wire, portable, lightweight fencing is so amazing. What I would do in that situation is that I would set your main paddock up on the perimeter of the orchard and then just every two days, give them a new almost like a clover leaf or a you know, a, a flower pattern, give them a new spot. Cause they'll go in and they'll clean up preferentially. They'll clean up every damn apple that's on the ground. What you don't want to do is leave them there for too long. So, that, cause they'll rub up against the trees. They'll root. Um, they'll, 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 they'll do all the things that, that boars can do. And so, or pigs, pigs in general, but, um, but yeah, you, you, let it rip, man. I've watched them do that with persimmons. I've watched my, my brother's peach orchard. I ran turkeys through my brother's peach orchard one time. You know, they were the fattest turkeys I've ever had. So Yeah, Renegade says you may need more apples based on the number of trees. And that's why I said all of it. All of it you don't want, they'll eat. And then, like, also think about waste streams, too. Like, if you're a cider maker, like, all that leftover – uh, apple pith. I mean, feed it to them. They'll eat the hell out of it. They don't. They don't really care. You know, they'll eat just like you said. They'll eat anything. So the only thing you have to think about is, do I want the thing I'm going to eat eating this thing? And as long as the answer to that's yes, I, I don't really think you can overfeed an animal when your goal is to make it fat quick so you can kill it and eat it and preserve it. Right? I mean, well, Jack, if the goal is to bring like-minded people together to preserve a, a, a great way of life, then I can see a, a local apple orchard partnering with a local distiller, partnering with you and yeah. your pigs, and you get together in the fall and you make apple cider, apple brandy, and slop the pigs with all the leftovers and winter, winter chicken dinner. Yeah, I think there's, you know, you kind of mentioned in your notes here some stuff about building community with this because this actually was a thing not that long ago in – Europe and America, both. Uh, and certainly down, like it still is in Mexico, uh, parts of New Mexico, where like whole groups get together and they take part in processing the pigs together because many hands make light work. Uh, during uh, World War II in England, they had these pig clubs where they weren't doing what we're doing. They were basically feeding the pigs all slop um, and they were kept in a, a pig pen. But I mean, meat was so heavily rationed, fat was so heavily rationed, you could do this pig club thing, and the government, you took it to the butcher, and the butcher had to be certified by the government, they split the pig in half, and all the members of the pig club split half the pig, and then the other half of the pig went to be sold into the city, into the ration market. So, like, this idea of, of people working together to raise pigs, to process pigs, and sharing the bounty is very, very old. And you're right, there's a lot of... Like the craft cider business right now is is growing probably faster than the microbrewery thing did in the nineties. Like that's mm-hmm. growing huge, and that means there's all these orchards. It's just waste stream. The craft distillery, like you, you mentioned that, so the brewing's already there, but now the craft distilleries are are growing. So this is all waste stream that can be funneled into pig farming, uh, and like you said, they're the thing that I love about them compared to. Uh, a cow and let me be fair if you say i don't know anything except my meal's going to be beef or pork i'm probably going to pick beef but it takes a long time to finish a cow well <laughs> and i ain't i ain't processing one 
I, I could do it if I had. To. I processed an elk by myself in the woods and had to carry it out in quarters. And I decided I would never do that again. That was that was hard. You know, when I was a much younger man in much better shape back then, I had pieces of it hanging in a tree, hoping a bear didn't come take it while I was packing it out. Never doing that again. The cow's bigger, right? Like the pig, we can grow that, like you said, six months from, from piglet to plate. And if you, like you said, downsize your, your finish weight a little bit, if you can process a deer or a, 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 a lamb, you can process a pig. And I'm, again, I, I'm glad you brought that up because it comes up all the time. You know, chickens are the fastest, pork's in the middle, along with, you know, lamb and, and, and goat. Um, that, that's sort of in the middle. And they, especially if you're just doing this on pasture and, you know, cows are way out here on the, on the far end and probably bison as well are probably way out here on the far end in terms of from the day it hits the ground to the day you're, you're eating it. Now you can obviously harvest a cow earlier, but, but you know, you, you want to fatten them up. Yeah. You know, the, the, the downside to a, a chicken or a pig is, you know, they're an omnivorous monogastric animal so you got to supplement them with feed uh, certainly at scale you have to do that but you, you know as a as an offset to that you get you get to eat sooner and you know i know there's a, a handful of pretty solid uh beef curing recipes out there but there there is no finer animal on the planet to salt and cure than pork and it Agreed. and it and it has to do with the magic uh, the, the way they build fat, the, the, it, it, it's, there's just nothing, there's no better animal on the planet, which is probably, again, one of the reasons why it was one of the earliest uh, animals to, to be domesticated is because we, we found salt a long time ago. Yeah. And then, you know, at some point we, we sort of figured this out. And, and again, when I cracked it, I thought it was going to be rot Jack, you know, and yeah. we cracked this thing open and it's like, and hell, I got them hanging up there. You could probably charge three, four, five hundred dollars. Oh, you get them. more for them now than the day that they were delivered to you, because there's a whole community around these really aged hams because they kind of age the way cheese does. They improve. I'm sure there's a there's a point that you go over that yes, maybe you shouldn't, and I don't know where that is, but you're not there. Um, it's just like you know they say an old bottle of wine. Well, how old? Right. You know, like a, a red will gen a good red for aging will generally peak at about 15 years. Right. So it, it ain't that I wouldn't really drink a really great gold label Chianti from 1985, but it probably passed peak. Um, and and I, I would bet that pork's the same way. The other thing with it for cured meats or uh, like sausage and stuff like that, I've made sausage almost out of everything that moves. And it's always better if there's a pork component added to it. So I've made sausage out of deer. You, you people think you add the pork for fat. It's more than the fat. It's, well, it's the texture. Like if you've ever made a meatball out of beef or lamb or venison or anything like that, and you haven't included pork, it's very dense, right? It it it, it might be good the second you cook it. But if you reheat it, it's it's like a freaking hammer. Uh, sausages, cured meats, like I've done beef, I've done venison, I've done duck, duck sausage is awesome. But I put 30% high fat pork with my duck sausage and a bit of Armagnac because, you know, because you got it. Because um, you got it. You got it. Right? You well, it. <laughs> so, you know, this this speaks to, not, not to plug it too much, but our skincare company, right? It, it's, it's fat based. It's pig fat based. And sure. b- back to what are you putting in? What part of the pig are you putting in with that, you know, beef sausage or venison sausage? It's usually the fat. Yeah. And, and that, yeah. that stick, that, that, that is a derivative of the beauty of this animal that is so aligned with human biology, right? Yeah. They, they metabolize vitamins the same way we do. They store those vitamins in their fat the same way we do. And so you raise a, Again, not all pigs are created equal either, but we've now we've got, you know, sites like Eat Wild and, uh, you know, you got various um, aggregators online to, to bring local farmers together with the consumer. So you, you can get a local 
you know, pasture based uh, pig, as long as that pig's not hemmed up uh, in, in a building with 450 of its closest friends and fed, you know, drugs to keep it from getting sick, yeah. then you're going to have a really healthy, uh, perfectly balanced uh, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, saturated fat, fatty acid profile. It melts, you know, lard mm-hmm. at room temperature is is creamy. Yeah, uh, it's it's got all these saturated fats in it. If you look at tallow at room temperature, it's almost hard as a rock. I love tallow as well, but there's something special about lard when it comes, especially on the culinary side of well, the house. Well, pig fat can get to- that soft, but it also can go through a grinder when you handle it right. And that's kind of a magical thing. And you were saying, you know, what part of the pig are you using? And like, generally when I'm making sausage, I'm using shoulder because it has that nice ratio of marbled fat. And it's inexpensive compared to, you know, I'm not going to put pork chops in there. Or whatever. Correct. Maybe like a really fatty pig, maybe straight trim off some of the extra fat off the back or something. Like we we do that with deer too. You, I'll do it down here because it ain't worth it. There's hardly any tallow on a deer in Texas. They'd probably oh. die in the heat if they had it. But like in Pennsylvania, when we killed a deer, you'd get three quarts of rendered tallow mm-hmm. off a deer just by trimming like off the back of the hams and down the back and all especially the deer that were living in the farmlands because they were hammering the corn, you know, at the end of the season, right, right when they were about to get hunted. Mountain deer, you'd get maybe a quart and a half. So there's a big difference just in what they're eating. Yeah. Uh, we're kind of off topic there, but yeah, I do. You know, you say you don't want to pimp the, the, the Pharaoh thing too much, but you, you pro- we're about wrapped up. You probably should tell people a little about it for those who didn't hear <laughs> you on your last interview and, and, and what you're doing with that. Yeah, so uh, we launched in January of last year. I, I have a great bit of gratitude for you. Uh, you were you were the first podcast interview I ever ever did about Faro. But we're we're a lard based skincare company. We have a, a handful of products: skin food for the neck down, face food for the neck up, and we we have a, an elixir, an oral elixir. Um, no no preservatives, no chemicals. We do use a little tallow, uh, lard, and leaf lard and a little honey in our products. So minimal ingredients, highly effective. Um, and, oh, there you go. We, we say the uh, the lard works in mysterious ways. And so, um, <laughs> and it does. I mean, Jack, I get I get emails, calls, texts every week. I, you know, it, I got to be careful about what I say, but, you know, it's like any chronic skin condition, It's it has shown to work extremely well. So, you know, the... Uh, eczema, psoriasis, gelitis, rosacea, any of these sort of underlying autoimmune problems that manifest in crappy skin. It's, uh, it's fantastic um, for treating those. Any acute skin condition, and trust me, I've tested every one of them now. Poison ivy, mosquito bites, chiggers, sunburn, you name it. It, it provides relief. Um, I tell people all the time, our creams are amazing not only but because of what's in them, but also what's not in them. And if you're, for your listener, if you if you pull out your skincare product and the first ingredient on there is water, throw it away because <laughs> there are chemicals. Well, so water emulsified with fat, fantastic, makes a beautiful cream, but your the water provides uh, food for mold and bacteria to grow. So they have to put all these crap chemicals in there to keep the cream shelf stable the problem is you know this our skin our gastrointestinal tract our hair we're covered in bugs we are there's like five to seven pounds of microscopic organisms living in and on the human body and so when you smear that store-bought cream on your skin you're effectively napalming your, your skin's own natural microbiome, which I would argue helps prevent poison ivy, helps prevent sunburn, helps prevent all the other ills, uh, you know, dry, chaps, chap skin, whatever. Um, I saw somebody's comment, if you can't eat it, don't put it on your skin. Hell yeah, you know, if, if it's not edible, your skin's going to eat things. It does eat things. And, um, you know, in nature... Uh, This is a thread I'm playing with right now, but if you think about natural noxious chemicals, think about that for a minute. There aren't, there aren't many, okay, that that naturally occurring in nature that you would just go up and interact with, right? Obviously, noxious chemicals from a spewing volcano, 
we're, we're probably not coming Poison in Ivy close contact maybe. with. Poison yeah. Ivy, maybe, right? Yeah. But but we've we've been able now to manufacture and distill and derive all these unnatural compounds that our skin now is coming into contact with on a constant basis. And who the hell knows? Um, so anyway, that, that, that was my quick commercial. Uh, okay. sur- survival is uh, is a is a discount code for your listeners. If uh, if anyone likes would like to uh, see how the lard works in mysterious ways, so thank you for that. Yeah, no problem, man. I enjoyed this discussion. I knew I would. I'm hungry now uh, for talking about cured meats. It's one of my freaking things I jones for at times. Like you know, just some salty cured piece of meat i don't even care what it is um so now i gotta go dig through and see what i got out there but uh thanks for being with us today charles jack it's been a pleasure i I will make you a promise before we go the next ham i pull off the uh the rack and clean off and cut open uh I, i will slice up and send you some I would appreciate that a great deal, man. Again, thanks for being with us today. And folks, the site is pharaoh.life, F-A-R-R-O-W dot life. There will be links to that, the books that Charles mentioned, I wrote down on my notes here, and everything else that we can do to help you will all be in the show notes for the audio once it goes up live for the audio side. If you're right here right now listening to us live, And you click the link in the video note below. It won't work because we're not quite done yet. But about an hour hour from right now, or if you're watching this in the future, uh, you'll be able to get that. And again, I'll have links to Charles' site, all his social media stuff, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, all that good stuff. And again, Charles, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Jack.